Uh, hello to everybody that's come back for another episode of the Startup Series at DevOps for Everyone. Excited to be joined by Henning Lang today, CEO and co-founder at Giant Swarm. Really interesting business um, out of Germany that I've been following and talking to for a while. Um, I won't even begin to do um, the company justice because Henning will give a much better introduction than I ever could. So straight over to you, Henning. Do you want to give an introduction of, of yourself and the business? Yeah, sure. Happy to do so. Hi, Joe. Um, pleasure being here today. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm Henning, uh, one of three co-founders at Giant Swarm and um, CEO. Um, personally, I'm a longtime um, founder since um, 2005. It's built um, two other tech companies, uh, uh, especially in the ad tech space and, um, and sold that. And um, yeah, um, what uh, there's always a question why we have started um, Giant Swarm. And um, so from our former business, um, we were competing in the ad tech ecosystem, especially with Google, and um, back in 2008, 2009. And uh, we had to obviously to move very fast um, to to survive and, and um, yeah, build a good business out of that. And um, at that time, we already adapted um, what we nowadays call a microservice architecture. And um, what we figured out, we needed to build uh, ourselves kind of a microservice infrastructure to run that. And there was no real good solution around. And so we had to do it was not the core of our former business. And um, uh, we saw very early on, um, so that's kind of our um, unfair advantage maybe, we saw very early on the benefits of DevOps and microservices um, being more agile and moving faster, iterating faster, um, delivering better um, value to our customers. And on the other hand, um, we had the challenge uh, to yeah, build ourselves a microservice infrastructure to, to run that. And that was kind of distracting. We learned that like uh, more than a quarter of the time of our DevOps teams was um, going into building and maintaining a microservice infrastructure. And um, so, as I said, it was not the core of the business and still it was um, necessary uh, to win uh, in the market. And uh, after we successfully sold that company and left in 2013, there was a question what's next and and, and um, mm. especially uh, both my co-founders uh, we, are, we are developers by heart and uh, for us it was very clear that software are going to eat the word and there was a um, famous statement at the time from mark and reason and um, that uh, clearly showed us and, and we believe very early on okay um, software becomes uh, relevant for each and every company and you need to move fast in the ecosystem to uh, to make a difference in the customer's life. And um, that means you're going to adapt DevOps and agile practices. You're going to adopt uh, microservices and with that containers. And uh, we understood that that's kind of a complex um, uh, challenge um, to many organizations and it uh, will not be the core. And, and so that's kind of the founding reason why we started Join Swarm back in 2014, very early on, the days before Kubernetes, I'd say. Yeah. Uh, there was the early Docker hype, uh, you might remember. And uh, yeah, we started with a vision um, to, because that was what we wanted to have, um, to have that as a managed service, simply not caring about just focusing with your DevOps team on, on your product, um, making a better um, customer experience. And uh, that's that's how we started generally. So that was actually going to be one of my first questions that you just mentioned there, Henning, about Kubernetes, because if the business started in 2014, I think Kubernetes was probably just, you know, like a thought in some brain in Google's brain back at that time. So what was the what was the early mission for the business back in 2014? Yeah, the early mission was definitely um, focused on developers. Uh, we because we thought, well, until big uh, enterprises come, that might take uh, quite a few years. Um, mm -hmm. so, so we built a complete kind of a Roku for grown-ups, or um, we call it Digital Ocean 2.0 version <laughs> of. Um, having a, a SaaS solution uh, where you could simply deploy your Docker containers and, and we would run the infrastructure below that. And um, that's how we started uh, with own data centers in Europe and the US. And, and we had a lot of traction very early on, lots of developers. Um, but also at the same time, we had the, the, the a unique challenge no one else had because we had the, the largest shared clusters and all the tooling we used in the early days. Um, and uh, we're, we're, that's where we struggled was uh, falling apart a little bit left and right. And obviously if it comes to infrastructure, I mean, like it, is, it needs to run. Yeah? Otherwise there's no value. It needs to be robust and it needs to run. And um, even for pets projects, uh, yeah. kind of. And um, so that, that was a challenge. And um, yeah, and then it was the early days. I remember still when Bretton Burns, uh, still at the time at Google um, called and, and um, asked us, hey, well, guys, what are you doing there? Because we had this, um, our first slogan on the, on, on the website was uh, simple service or 
orchestration. Right? And okay. uh, obviously that was going a little bit in, in the hands and it was a very small ecosystem in the early days. And there was um, the, the Kubernetes founders um, still at Google uh, around and, and then there was the Docker founders and, and, and maybe the core S guys and, 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 and us. Right, okay, fair enough. So that was back in 2014 and then how did the, the first business model look in terms of you know, in terms of today, how does the business compare today to what it was back in 2014? I can imagine that there's been some fundamental changes, maybe in, in the tech, maybe in type of customers that you target, the way you run the business. Yeah, so, so from uh, um, from our approach, it was always we, we were very developer focused and the developer is still our end users at the end mm -hmm. of the day, because it's we, we very much believe that the DevOps teams and developers are the rock star of this century. They can make a huge difference by solving uh, hard problems with great software. And um, But what has definitely changed is that we are not targeting a single developer because we learned very early on. And it's not only about tech, it's about um, teaching, training, and, and transferring the whole know-how to all um, people we are working with. And um, obviously, um, bigger um, accounts and customers can, can spend more money on that, or maybe it was in the startup world, uh, or just um, in single developers uh, for their pet projects. And um, so what, what, when, when a real change happened, that was uh, somehow mid-2015 and 2015, uh, when we were uh, first time um, joining DockerCon in San Francisco and uh, bigger organizations approached us and said, that's pretty cool stuff, what are you doing? But I like to run that in my data center. We're like, oh, okay, and, and you're whatever from big American banks and, and other global um, Fortune 500 companies. And we are like, okay. And um, that was also the time when, when we started looking into Kubernetes. And um, that's where we did kind of a pivot um, at the end, focusing on big enterprise customers with different needs, running it not in our data centers, but in their data center on their cloud accounts. Um, and 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 building kind of a dedicated private control plane in their data center and cloud accounts and focusing on them. Um, what was good because we, we knew the problem of running a large shared cluster that from that day on already we started um, building our product um, that way that we had a multi-cluster approach running a fleet of clusters because that was a problem we saw also super early on. And for us, it was very clear that it will be highly beneficial uh, to a larger organization that running fleets of clusters, not having like one, two big clusters, even if you could use um, uh, namespaces to separate uh, environments. Yeah. So your customers are, are the larger enterprise businesses that you just mentioned? Yeah, today, uh, yeah, um, we, we definitely focus on large uh, enterprise customers that want to use Kubernetes at scale. Um, okay. that, that's what we're doing since 2016. Um, we have been really fortunate uh, winning customers that early on, um, being at like Adidas um, and, and Vodafone, both um, Fortune 500 companies. And um, with that, also we, we got very early on a strong demand for security. Uh, and you can imagine if you're running uh, Kubernetes inside of one of the largest takeovers um, at that time, um, you get all the, the highest security requirements and as security in Docker was not that great from our perspective. Uh, we even joined um, the small team um, building the suspension for Kubernetes um, because we had a unique insight in there. I find that security is sometimes like an afterthought for a lot of businesses when they want to adopt Kubernetes or implement Kubernetes? Is security always something that is like a day two problem, but you think it should be like a, a day zero problem? Yeah, I, uh, yeah, I, I think always long term. And, and, and that's what we can see like patterns of cloud native journeys and, and where you fail um, as many organizations are like, generally Kubernetes is growing on the edge. It, it is empowering de developers. And, and so they simply start if, if they don't have support from, from a kind of a central platform team because it's simply not there or from the IT infrastructure team, they just start stuff and, and, and every team is doing it somehow differently. And, and maybe security is, as you're describing it more as day two and, and maybe even um, postpone further. And then you have like um, the challenge nowadays and like with shadow IT, et cetera, you have the challenge, you have lots of different setups and, and organizations, many are on that journey uh, rethinking now how they want to run Kubernetes at scale. I'm like, it's also around efficiency. 
if you have like each and every team in reinventing the wheel uh, every day, uh, building their own type of stack and, 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 and there's definitely an, an efficiency um, gains you can make if you have a central offering supporting the teams, not taking away the freedom. I mean, that's super important. I'm like, uh, everything what we're talking about technology, it should empower the DevOps team. Uh, you want to make them fly. You want to make them able to run. Um, so you need to to make sure that you don't put chains on them. But security obviously is an important topic and, and governance, et cetera, and, and, and to have a central control um, to at least understand what's happening. It's super important. And maybe not only after like two or three years um, from our perspective. So if we get to start talking with the customers, we always ask for um, security joining in on day one. Uh, um, because they also need to understand that's a different word than what they know um, before uh, security and uh, microservices container environment is somehow different. Yeah, absolutely. Talking of Giant Swarm's customers, I watched the keynote speech with Adidas. I think it was a couple of years ago now. Um, it's a huge conference. I watched it on YouTube. It was on your LinkedIn page. And that was a pretty cool talk that um, the guys, it was a joint talk actually, someone from Adidas and someone from Giant Swarm, probably one of your co-founders. And it was a, pretty impressive to hear what you did for Adidas and with Adidas because obviously everybody knows who they are and what, what business they're in. I think it was maybe like the Black Friday sales or something like that and then the platform just exploded, you know. So um, what you managed to do with them was, was pretty cool. I, I liked watching that. So we'd be amiss if we didn't talk about the current state that the world's in at the moment. How has COVID and everything like that affected giant swarm and, and your market strategy in the last say 12 to 18 months yeah thanks for that question i mean like uh, generally i look at it uh, always from uh, people uh, perspective first so and at giant swarm we have like always um the, the real like people um product and profit so we always look at our people because only um having an amazing uh, team um and build great products and outstanding services and that might lead um, to profits. And uh, so from a people perspective, even though we have been a remote first company since 2014, um, so mm. we are kind of used to working remote, um, there was still some impact obviously because situation at home is different um, for, for many of us um, because we have kids and, and there's homeschooling and, and um, yeah, if, uh, if those are working from, from home, uh, it, it's challenging. And uh, also what we missed a little bit, we need typically as a team at least twice a year for a full week um, wherever to clear nice and um, nice spots um, because um, the bonding is also um, very very important also as a remote first company so that's 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 number one uh, number two was like we were really lucky um, that we are so critical um, to most of our customers um, so for example you mentioned Adidas earlier um, um, it's no secret that Adidas is a, a big retailer um, of sporting goods um, was high affected because they had to close down their shops um, starting in China, then in Europe, then the US. Um, and, and so they definitely had to pull even more um, uh, on, on e-commerce and betting on e-commerce. Mm -hmm. and, and that's where we are relevant uh, because what you mentioned before, it was not Black Friday, but a hype sale, um, which, uh, which is a different challenge because within a hype sale, which Adidas is doing, like you get like 40,000, 50,000 times um, more requests within a second. And, 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 and that has become kind of a new normal um, due to COVID. Uh, and wow. um, so they're now doing more than like 4 billion in revenue um, online last year, um, 10 times more than when we started working with them, for example. Wow. Uh, on the other hand, it was also clear that people will re um, review a little bit. And so, so we also saw some washout where we are more kind of a nice to have. So, so companies that uh, have maybe stopped software development um, based on COVID and, and other things happening around them. And, um, and, and, and where we are kind of a must have where people are really want to, to, to scale. Um, right now, I, I definitely see um, since yeah Q4, um, the market is picking up. Companies understand they need to get um, yeah speed up their digitalization. Um, they don't stop investing into IT, um, even if people have been um, on short. And here in Europe, that's kind of a standard model. Like um, you can have like uh, sh short labor work, um, and, and you get some, some some funding from the states, um, particularly here in Germany and also in other European countries. Um, but in IT, they haven't done it. Yeah. So people are working 100 percent, and, and and they're just pushing forward. And that's what we notice right now. And like we have the strongest few months uh, just since beginning of the year uh, in the business. And yeah, I'm, I'm very optimistic and, and hopefully, I mean, like we get wax hopefully. 
uh, everyone in the next couple of months, also on a global scale. If you look right now at India, we are a little bit, or I'm a little bit worried about that situation and seeing that crisis there. Um, but yeah, I hope we can resolve that in the next six, 12 months. So having a completely remote workforce, even prior to COVID, I guess you guys um, keeping spirits high, you know, doing stuff like this, like a Zoom call or a Teams call, you do weekly or daily stand-ups. How do you keep all the guys motivated? Because I'm guessing you've got people maybe across Europe, not just in Germany, maybe even US, Asia, perhaps. Yeah, right. Uh, the team is uh, sp split around the, the world uh, by now. Um, most of us are still in the European uh, time zones. Um, that's where the core of the team is, but we have also a few um, colleagues in, in North America and in Asia. Um, yeah, how we do it. I mean, like, uh, the teams are collaborating. Uh, we're very strict, uh, obviously, and we try always to keep meetings internally short. Um, but we have, as an organization today, of 60. Um, we have a team of five that is taking care of people and people operations. Oh, okay, and um, so we, we are, they are getting really creative of, of doing things uh, um, with, with the team. Um, also with our customers, we do quite uh, a few things, uh, either in the early mornings having um, com um, coffee together, uh, we'll ship uh, something up front or, or in the evenings uh, because uh, bringing, bringing the right people together in a more intimate um, way and fashion um, that's very important to us. As I said, like people still, I mean, like we are, we are obviously, we are building great technology and, and running great technology. Um, but at the end of the day, it's always people. And um, that's true on, on our side and our customer, customer side as well. Yeah. And um, yeah, I, I think Anna, like our um, VP of people operations, she would be kind of a perfect fit because um, she and her team are just been doing an amazing job there. Yeah. Excellent. What kind of things do they do to, to keep the guys motivated? Because even Interquest, Interquest yeah. are completely remote now as well. You know, we've got people in New York, we've got an office in New York, got four or five offices in the UK. So what yeah. do you guys get up to? Yeah, I think what's uh, in, a, in a remote company generally missing is, 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 is what happens in a workplace. Yeah, um, serendipity, you're running in, in, into somebody while picking a, getting a coffee, while mm. going outside for a walk and so on. So that, that that's what they try to mimic um, with a few things. Uh, we even did last year in September, one week uh, remote um, offsite uh, generally. Uh, and, and they got creative of, of organizing a nice program. So it was it, if we do an offsite, it's not too much around work it's more about uh, getting to know each other having some fun and um, so we, we had a mechanician in, in there one evening um, uh, for example we had another um, great speaker um, and just around learning and teaching and then you know, coming together on different topics also within um, our slack um, we have different type of channels around um, parents any type of books and reading mm. and uh, hobbies sports um, we we have a common yoga remote yoga class which are every week um, there's so many things um, I, I even can't mention them all um, but yeah there, there's lots of offers and, and we try a lot we try a lot and then get feedback uh, we try to understand what are the real challenges for people um, with this remote thing and uh, yeah Love that. Yeah. So the yoga thing is something that my company started up a while ago as well. And we actually the other week did a virtual game show. There was about seven or eight of us in a virtual game show where you're kind of looking at the screen on the Zoom and then you're answering questions through your app and there's a league table going on. So it's good fun. It's really in interesting to, to hear how other companies approach things like, you know, mental well-being and just engaging colleagues wherever they are in the world, because obviously you've got a battle with the time zones as well. So all that to, to think of. Earlier on, about five minutes ago, you mentioned, or right at the start of the chat, you mentioned about um, going to, to like Docker events and joining up with Docker and, and people like that. Do you still get involved with online events now, like KubeCon or CloudNativeCon, for example? Do you sponsor events? No, that is something um, that we have been also very strict. In 2019, um, we, we have been sponsoring many events around the globe. Um, KubeCon um, on, on all continents, for example, or, or in the US, big, big shows like reInvent and Inspire, uh, and, and also here in Europe, um, a little bit smaller um, container, very container uh, cloud native technology focused events uh, and some industry events. Um, so we have been in there. Um, but what we always wanted to have is like, I mean, like, what, what are events about? Obviously, we send people um, to watch talks, but I mean, like, right now, they, 
there's just too much content out there in Germany. Yeah, there's yeah. so many webinars and obviously we also do webinars and um you know, we always try different things and and, and so we, we have not really sponsored any, any events even though we are committed um especially towards the cncf community um so it would be more kind of a financial um thing we would do um just to support um, the cncf there uh, as we also support for example um both um, um financially at, at, at many open source projects uh, for example because uh, we benefit a lot of um, open source, obviously. Um, but no, we, we, we take a little bit different approach. So we do more kind of roundtables with partners um, where we don't try to, to bring too many people together. Um, so we have webinars where we often have like hundreds of, uh, um, of registrations. Um, but that is kind of, we are communicating something. What we like to do is like in roundtables, bringing peers together that have the same challenges and 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 and, and really open up and, and talk to each other. Um, and then obviously also we do that with uh, all our customers, um, mostly in the evenings where we ship whatever. We do cocktail classes with them or having some beer or wine. Uh, customers are presenting um, something, one of their challenges, how they solved it. And this is not always um, around technology. Um, that can be a very different topic. So last, uh, I think it was two weeks ago, we had one with our customers. We talked about only people things again. Uh, so from remote work, um, uh, obviously, to offshoring uh, to different um, countries, uh, transparent salaries, self-set salaries, how, how, how the future looks like around the war of talent um etc so um yeah, very different topics and it's always great to to get the insights from from some awesome companies yeah i really like that idea about your open tables and your round tables with the customers something that you and i talked about offline i really i really got behind that actually because it's um like you just said you know there's so much content out there at the moment whether it's webinars whether it's events whether it's this you know there's, there's just so much out there at the moment so to bring a group of maybe six, eight, 10, 12 of peers together who all have the same pain point, I think is um, there's real value in that. And I've, I've been following yours online as well when you posted on, on LinkedIn and you can see the kind of information that's shared. So I really feel like it's, it's good value. Something that's quite big that I wanted to touch on today was again, what you and I talked about offline was the container as a service market, the predictions by 2025 and the major players. So for those that don't know, um, Giant Swarm is named among companies like, and I'll circulate the list as well, but companies like Cisco, IBM, Amazon, Google, some huge organizations. And Giant Swarm is in there as well, mentioned as one of the leading players in the container as a service market. So predictions by 2025 is that Giant Swarm will be a huge player in this market, which I guess I want to just say, what do you think about that? Because those are some big, big companies you've been mentioned alongside there. Yeah, I mean, obviously we're feeling a little bit on earth, um, and, but there's a big difference. I mean, these are huge organizations and they make a different impact than what we do, um, but we focus very much on the impact we can make on, on our customers and the companies we are working with. And uh, even um, before we decided founding Giant Swarm back in 2014, um, it was very clear to us that this is a long, long journey ahead. And at the end of the day, there will be the big players and potentially if we are lucky and, and, and um, do, do the things right, um, we might be in there as well, um, maybe in different scale and size. But what we are differentiating is like um, how we work with our customers. And that is super important to our customers. So we have never been a product only company selling a product and a license trying to people log in. Uh, we are kind of an open source um, company. We, we don't want to log any of our customers in exact amazing service. So they should be always um, be free. And, and, and we are currently just opening up that again, because obviously somehow our own Kubernetes distribution is a little log in um, because if you want to move to some some other um, um, Kubernetes distribution, you still need to migrate, which is a, a barrier or a hurdle and can hurt uh, a little bit or, and it will take time and um, so resources and money at the end of the day. And uh, adopting now cluster API and, and um, providing that open source product 100% um, free and not layering it way to our customers will allow them simply to go on each and every Kubernetes um, 
um, being it from the big hyperscalers, uh, AKS, UKS, GKE, and you can name it. Um, obviously, they could also use our, um, but then, um, yeah, so that, that's what I see very positive. And um, yeah, we're being an open source company and just providing an amazing um, end service and helping the customers on their journey. And I think this value will never go away. And, and what is also important on the journey, so I, shortly after we started, I'm like, um, Docker and Mesosphere, when we start, we're kind of the stars in the ecosystem. Um, but then Kubernetes came around and it was very hard for them to, to adopt um, uh, at the speed and the scale they were already are. Um, so and that made us uh, very early aware that it's just technology and technology is interchangeable and it will always be. Uh, and that's how we built the company. It's only components that needs to be interchangeable. Um, it's not too much effort on our side. But providing all that open source technology, if somebody needs to take care of it and being the world best in that, that's still our core focus. Brilliant. That's really good, you know, that you say that as technology changes, the company can pivot. You know, you've already proved it from, from Docker to Kubernetes. So I think having that is going to be setting the company up for, for long term success. Um, which brings me on to my next question. One of my final questions, Henning, actually. Uh, it's, it's a strange 18 months for everybody, um, but, you know, Giant Swarm's been, been doing really, really well. Um, you can see by, by talking to you today and just by looking online. So by the end of 2021, where, where do you want the company to be? What's your plan for this year? <laughs> that is also where we're a little bit different. I mean, like, uh, obviously, we, we have also our objectives we are setting. Um, but we, we are used to that we always do every day um, the best we can do, uh, getting better each and every day. For, for us, it's always, uh, as, as our friends of AWS are mentioning, it's always day one. Uh, um, mm -hmm. We are challenging status quo each and every day. Um, for us, obviously, uh, like, um, people, we want to keep our people happy. Uh, we want to stay independent, um, being um, own the company and our our future. Um, that's very important to us. That means that we are working profitable, that we are growing at a reasonable speed, um, um, that our customers are happy and they love us. Um, that's also super important, obviously, to us that we are growing uh, as an organization. Um, it's not always uh, written in stone, so we don't have like an NBC who pushes us. You need to double each and every year or triple or whatever. Uh, obviously, we have some self set ambitions um, doing that, and, and currently they are growing uh, because confidence is growing um, as we are well positioned in the marketplace. But that's how, how we are. Um, There's some strategic stuff we might think about uh, long term, um, um, how we want to grow the company further. Um, but yeah, that's maybe for another one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, well, that'd be version 2.0 we'll yeah. further down the line. So um, final question for me, Henry, before we sign off. Uh, last week, I did one of these startup series with uh, a guy from San Francisco who hasn't even launched the business yet. You know, it's him and a couple of others. They're very much in the Kubernetes world. He comes from a Kubernetes developer background. You know, he's a hands-on guy like your co-founders. So for, for founders, for CTOs, CEOs that are just beginning to enter this world, the Kubernetes world that's blowing up, what... What would your advice be now that you're a few month, few years in? What would your advice be to people entering this market for brand new products or service? Uh, offering services in the ecosystem or using it? Offering. Offering. Um, ooh, yeah, I mean, like, uh, if you look around, there's so many things. I'm like, obviously, there's like, um, there's less and less value in, in, in providing and managing the Kubernetes um, in general. Uh, I think you, uh, we are all moving more up, up the stack, and there's different um, challenges each and every platform team has to resolve, and and uh, focusing on that can be more. And we have seen many plays in that, obviously. Yeah. The, um, observability stack, security stack, you have to build up. Um, I still think more and more players um, and, and, and companies are now looking at cost optimization within the container ecosystem, for example. We also look in a few companies right now. Uh, we do more and more ourselves uh, in there, for example. There's still um, niches. Um, I know there's also companies around 
using AI um, uh, to, to, to optimize costs, for example, there are not yet too many companies maybe at that scale that that's so relevant. Um, it's still about speed of your, um, of your development teams. It's for the good ones, it's always core one uh, target. It's not about cost control, but obviously uh, if, if you run um, lots of clusters, um, yeah, hundreds of thousands of containers, et cetera, costs um, obviously, um, are also like uh, meaningful uh, and you can save a lot if you use like whatever horizontal and vertical pod auto scaling and there's some tooling around that and if you understand that um, that would be one um, I think one big thing uh, what we are also currently working on with customers um, um, is like getting this max stack um, into the Kubernetes world so Spark, Cassandra, Kafka etc um, and um, yeah so there's still some stuff and then we see obviously also, but this is a topic for the last few years, um, edge um, is a thing. Uh, I think it gets more and more real. There's different type of edge use cases. Um, so there's the edge, edge use case where you have like um, real racks and servers being it in stores or warehouses or factories, etc. cetera. Um, so that's kind of a different than um, having um, maybe hundreds of thousands of devices or um, telecommunication towers um, around the globe and, and, and having their like a very small and tiny um, air setups um, to run your containers in. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a very competitive market, very competitive world, but it's, it's the ones that be in right now, in my opinion, when it comes to Kubernetes, you know, it has to be has to be a real value. There's a lot of people out there. I think, like you said at the start of the call, you know, there's a lot of people out there who, who want to adopt Kubernetes, who want to implement Kubernetes, who just want Kubernetes because it's it's everywhere at the moment. But I think unless you've got the knowledge and the um, the resources, you know, it's, it's an open source community. So definitely lean on the community and, and figure out what your your USP is. But Henning, um, that's that's all the questions I had. I really appreciate you coming on today. It's been um, for me really insightful, really insightful to have a, a chat with you. Um, just really nice chat. Understand a bit about the business and the, the people behind the business as well. What were the three P's? It was people. Uh, people, prior profits. By the way, it's it's not from us. It's it's copied from uh, um, um, Ben Horowitz. Um, uh, I think. Uh, if I'm right, but I, that's how I remember it. I read, um, read it one day in his book, um, Hard Work. And, um, uh, and, and and yeah, we used it and all our company is structured that way. Uh, even our Google Drive and the VK, everything is structured that way. And uh, also our monthly Joe figs. Um, there's always a people update first. Um, so we put our people first um, because as I said, I'm, I'm 100% convinced it's it's about the people um, having the right talents. Um, yeah, um, remove the barriers they might be running in, um, make them fly, make them build great products, and um, delivering the services. And, and that has been working extremely well for us. Brilliant. Well, I'd love to catch up with you in a couple of months' time, maybe towards the end of the year, see how the business is getting on, see how you guys are getting on um, once COVID is a thing of the past, hopefully. But I wish you every success and um, stay well, Henning. It was really good to speak with you today. Yeah, Joe, thanks a lot. It was a real pleasure. And yeah, let's keep in touch. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And stay yeah. safe, obviously, everyone out there. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. All the best. Bye. Yeah, cheers. Bye.